Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today to talk about the 10th anniversary of uh, Castlet operation in Gaza in 2008-2009, known as the Castlet operation by Israel. Uh, my name is Yusuf Al Jamal. I am from Aki village in occupied Palestine. I grew up in Nusayrat refugee camp in Gaza. Uh, I am speaking to you from Turkey, where I am doing my graduate um, studies. Uh, as many of you uh, already know, the offensive in 2008-2009 resulted in the murder of uh, 1,500 Palestinians and the injury of uh, 5,000 others, including uh, the murder of 308 uh, children. I will uh, just give you an introduction. Uh, some statistics that will help you uh, contextualize uh, what happened in 2008-2009 uh, uh, in Gaza. So according to the UN, uh, 3,540 housing units were completely destroyed uh, and almost uh, 2,800 sustained severe uh, damage. Uh, some 20,000 people were made homeless by Israel and 260 uh, and 68 private businesses were uh, destroyed. Uh, another uh, 432 were uh, damaged. 18 schools, including eight kindergartens, were destroyed, and at least 262 others were uh, damaged. Uh, today, we are here to talk about what Israel calls the Castle Operation, what, is, what Palestinians call the two, 2008 massacre. Uh, but we are also here to talk about Palestinian culture, to celebrate Palestinian culture and literature and food. Uh, as you see in the background, I have the map of Palestine here, uh, which represents the different uh, embroidery uh, patterns of Palestinian uh, cities and uh, villages, which uh, Palestinian women um, wear, uh, the traditional Palestinian dress known as the thop. Uh, we are here to stress our culture and food. We are here to tell the, the Haaretz newspaper that claims that shawarma is an Israeli food, that is uh, a Palestinian food, uh, because this is, is equally uh, important. Israel is waging offensives one after another against Gaza to erase us as Palestinians and to, to erase our uh, culture and food and literature as well. Um, as you see in the background as well, I have the poster of Gaza Writes Back, uh, which is a collection of short stories published by Just World Books and edited by uh, my friend Rifat Larir. I would like to start my speech uh, by quoting uh, Rifat in his book, uh, in which he says, To Palestine, to Gaza, and despite Israel's death sentences, like led cast upon the head, gnawing at our life, clinging to it like a flea to a kitten, and stuffed in our throats, the moment we say Amen, to the prayers of old women and men, looking their ways to God, we dream, we pray, clinging to life even harder, every time a dear, a dear one's life is forcibly rooted up, we live, we live, we do. I would like also to start by uh, a very uh, nice creation uh, by Ibrahim Nasrallah, a Palestinian novelist, in his famous uh, novel, The Time of White Horses, in which he says, after all these years under incubation, we are still beautiful as if we live above incubation, not under it. So this shows, you know, the Palestinian spirit of sumud, steadfastness and uh, resilience. So after this, uh, introduction which helped us contextualize what happened uh, 10 years ago in Gaza. Uh, I will jump to questions uh, that we received by email. So the first question was about, you know, the, the differences in attacks um, that, you know, between the 2008, 2012 and the 2014 offensives on Gaza and how the Gaza uh, population coped with each uh, one. Uh, and uh, what is happening to resilience in the face of this level of repeated drama 
the question uh, says. So in answer to this question, uh, I think what uh, makes the 2008-2009 offensive unique was the fact that it was about shock. So it shocked the Palestinian uh, population in Gaza because it, wa it was the first of its kind. I never, you know, my generation never experienced something like that uh, before. Uh, the number of people who were killed was shocking. The way Israel carried, uh, carried out the, the attack uh, on Saturday, which is uh, a holy day for Jews, uh, the Jewish Shabbat was also remarkable. Uh, the number of facilities attacked at the same time, 1127 a.m. in the morning. It was Saturday. I still remember this very well. Uh, so it was my first experience, my generation's first experience in terms of numbers, the way the attack was launched. Uh, while in 2012, the offensive was about defiance. So because of the changes we have seen in the Arab world, uh, following what was called by then the Arab Spring, and how you know there was a change in leadership in some Arab countries, especially in Egypt. Uh, so Palestinians felt empowered in a way or another that they had, you know, they needed support. And um, the fact that Israel uh, assassinated one of Hamas top leaders in Gaza, then Hamas retaliated uh, by firing uh, homemade projectiles into Israel's capital, Tel Aviv, for the first time ever, you know, to do this from Gaza, from a Palestinian territory. So there was this uh, sense of, uh, you know, being victorious. Uh, um, while, and then, you know, the, the experience of Palestinians in 2008-2009 helped them again in 2012 to cope. So they had more experience, you know, how to, for example, when there is uh, food shortages or, or bread shortages, how to deal with that, uh, how to help each other uh, under, you know, bombing and um, killing. Uh, in 2014, I was not in Gaza, so uh, I cannot speak of a direct experience, but based on my observation and, you know, asking my friends and upon uh, returning back to Gaza in 2015 and listening to the many stories of my friends and relatives, the offensive was huge at all levels compared to 2012. 2012 only lasted for one week and uh, again it was much larger than 2008-2009 uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the people killed, the people were killed in masses. Uh, and uh, Israel tried to push them out of their houses. So Israel was trying to displace them, uh, to kick them out of their houses, out of their neighborhoods. But Palestinians were strong and uh, resilient. Um, so Palestinians learned from their experience, experiences in 2012, 2008, and decided never to leave uh, their houses, even if this meant that they would die inside these houses. Uh, so again, there was more killing in 2014, more destruction uh, compared to 2008, uh, 2012. In fact, the destruction was uh, way larger and bigger than both uh, offensives uh, altogether. Uh, so in terms of resilience, resilience is always there. We are strong. Israel cannot break our will. Um, and as our Irish brothers and sisters say, our day uh, will come. So resilience is always there. Um, again, so we have here another question. Uh, how, you know, the destruction of Gaza, infrastructure and economy, and with the, you know, unemployment, high unemployment rates, uh, especially among young people, uh, is there like a brain drain among uh, college students, educated people? The, the, um, the answer is unfortunately yes. Um, a lot of my friends left Gaza, some of them left Gaza uh, to you know, seek education and professional uh, development, but this is just one side of the story. Uh, so we have also people who uh, plan to return back 
uh, upon finishing their education. Uh, they wanted to make use of what they described as, you know, a waste time in Gaza because there is nothing to do these days in Gaza, according to them. So they tried to seek education and professional development. Um, but even with the, you know, the increasing number of young people leaving Gaza, when I view this issue, I, I view it differently. I think we need advocates for Palestine, among Palestinians everywhere. And many of these people who leave Gaza uh, serve as ambassadors for Palestine in Europe, the US, or elsewhere, wherever they go. They speak of their own experience being in Gaza, experiencing all these you know, offensives on Gaza, first-hand experiences uh, that many people uh, should listen to. Uh, we have another question here. Yeah, the possible resolution of the Hamas Fatih uh, in Paris, uh, particularly uh, after Abbas dies. I think the main problem Palestinians um, are suffering from is the implications of the Oslo Accords, uh, which made Palestinians uh, face each other instead of facing the Israeli occupation. And for any deal to be to be successful between Palestinians, I think whatever happened after the Oslo Accords and the, the results of the, the outcomes of the Oslo Accords has to be, you know, dealt with. Has, Oslo has to be dismantled as a process. We got nothing from Oslo. We only got vision. Uh, Israel expanded its settlements, it's creating apartheid walls uh, and roads as well in the West Bank, bringing more settlers in, in Saja, in, in, in Gaza, it's besieging the people of Gaza. We have siege now for 12 years. So what, what we need to do is to dismantle the Oslo process as a whole, and then to have general <coughs> elections, sorry, that represent Palestinians, uh, regardless of where they are, including Palestinians in the diaspora. Um, we need to sort of give new blood to our leadership and uh, to have a representation for all sectors of the society, all Palestinians, regardless of what uh, they think of or where they live, as I said. Uh, and, and any you know, resolution that uh, doesn't include these elements, I think, will eventually uh, uh, fail. So we have to include these elements. We have to dismantle the whole Oslo process and then to have elections. And once we have a good representation, we can speak uh, to the world. Um, there is another question here. Okay, so the situation of healthcare system or not system after three major attacks on civilian infrastructure and the recent uh, defunding of UNRWA. So in 2007, my sister was in need for a minor surgery, uh, but due to the lack of medical equipment in Gaza needed for the surgery, she had to be referred to a hospital outside Gaza and Israel denied her a permit and she kept waiting and her health uh, situation kept uh, getting worse and eventually she left to Cairo but it was too late and she lost her life in Cairo uh, as a result of not uh, you know having the, the surgery on time however it was a, a minor issue this was in 2007, so you can imagine how the health sector in Gaza is today after, as you mentioned, three Israeli um, attacks, major attacks. Um, today, the health system, or non-system as you put it, is collapsing. It has been collapsing, but thanks to the resilience and support of the Palestinian people, it has not completely collapsed yet. Um, Gaza's hospitals uh, ran out of uh, critically needed drugs for many chronic diseases. According to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, electricity outages affect the operation of Gaza's hospitals. Gaza is always in need for fuel, which run uh, generators uh, that run hospitals. And this put the lives of patients uh, at risk always. Gaza lacks 50% of cancer drugs, for example, 72% of uh, first 
a drugs and medicines, uh, especially drugs needed for uh, diabetes, blood pressure, while 61% of the drugs needed for uh, inherited diseases are no longer on the shelves of the Ministry of Health. In other words, the health sector is collapsing for a long time. Companies working at Gaza's hospitals, for example, cleaning companies or um, food, you know, companies that provide food for uh, patients, they have been on a strike because they did not receive their salaries for sometimes three or four months. You could imagine, you know, when the cleaning teams stop working, what would happen at Gaza's hospitals, uh, in addition to the lack of fuel and medicine, which is uh, a totally different um, catastrophe. As for UNRWA, um, UNRWA said if the deficit in its budget continue, it will close some clinics in Gaza, as well as in other parts of, of Palestine and even refugee camps elsewhere in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and it would terminate the contract of many of its staff, reduce medical services to only to chronic uh, diseases. So they will have, uh, this will have a direct impact on uh, Palestinians in Gaza and elsewhere, especially Palestinian refugees. Uh, there is a question here about the impact of cost led and subsequent tours on, on Hamas. Okay, so every time Israel launches an attack uh, or an offensive on Gaza, it says it aims to eradicate Hamas and destroy its network of tunnels and uh, homemade uh, projectiles. But all offensives ended up with Hamas sending the last homemade projectile into Israel. Israel destroys some tunnels here and there belonging to Hamas and other Palestinian factions as well. Uh, kill dozens of hundreds of Hamas members and uh, members of other Palestinian uh, armed groups, but it never was able to defeat Hamas and other Palestinian factions as we see. In fact, we have seen how Hamas fighters were able to inflict much damage to Israeli soldiers at Gaza's fence during the 2014 offensive. Israel, to conclude, Israel is good at one thing, destroying houses, murdering entire families and causing damage to the civilian population. We have seen how the majority of victims on the Palestinian sides were civilians, while the majority of Israelis killed by Palestinians were uh, soldiers. Okay, another question. Can you share one or two of your most vivid memories of Castle? Okay, so whenever you ask a Palestinian from Gaza about the most vivid experience of cast-led operation. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the moment, you know, the offensive started. So I was studying for a final exam. It was a Saturday, as I said, 27th of December 2008, and I had an exam at the Islamic University of Gaza, and I decided to take a break exactly at 11.27 a.m., the, the offensive started and uh, I started hearing, you know, bombing everywhere as if, you know, hell broke out. So I thought maybe they targeted, you know, a place here or there, a building here or there. And as, you know, the, the uh, news started spreading and uh, people went out to the streets to see what happened and they started calling their beloved ones, uh, people in Gaza realized that, um, you know, the uh, attack uh, or the offensive uh, was carried out at the same time and targeted uh, dozens of governmental buildings, police stations, uh, and different facilities. So it was not uh, one building or one police station. We're talking about dozens at the same time, which resulted in the killing of uh, more than 200 uh, people. Uh, mo most of them were uh, police officers. Um, the attack took place when kids were coming back from school. Uh, it took Palestinians in Gaza a while to realize what actually was happening. Everyone thought that Israeli forces targeted one specific building, as I said, but later in the day, 
they learned that Israel targeted most governmental buildings at the same uh, time. So this is one vivid memory that I have and every single one in Gaza has uh, about the, the attack and the moment it started and the shock we had, and the confusion, not knowing what actually happened. The second most vivid memory I have, uh, so there is a police station to the east of my refugee camp, in Nusayrat refugee camp, called Abu Medin Police Station, located at Salah al-Din Street to the east of my refugee camp. And one of my distant cousins named Ibrahim al-Jamal was reported missing under the rubble of the police station. So the family kept looking for him until uh, sunset. We found him finally, and it took us a while to make sure it was him because his head was separated from his body. So this is the um, one of the vivid memories I have, painful memories I have of, of Castlet. Um, there is a related question here. <coughs> Sorry, what effect did you see Castlet have on your family and friends? Okay, as I mentioned, you know, my distant cousin was killed and two of my neighbors were killed as well. Uh, one of them is named Ahmed Tawil. He was eight years old. So Ahmed's family used to live next to a mosque in my neighborhood. And uh, there was a rumor in the neighborhood that Israel uh, will target the mosque because Israel targeted many mosques during uh, its uh, different offensives on Gaza. So the family evacuated the house and they went to their uncle's house. Uh, so Ahmed, uh, was playing football at the time when an Israeli F-16 targeted the area where he was playing and he was killed uh, as a result. Uh, so he, he escaped from his fate to his fate. He escaped from death to death. Uh, another civil defense employee who uh, happened to be my neighbor as well was killed. His name was, was Muhammad Al-Qatrawi. Uh, Actually, on the first day of the bombing, I counted some 35, 40 people who I knew who were killed. And then I lost counting afterwards. So the, the shock again was uh, very strong and uh, it took us a while <coughs> to recover and realize what happened. Uh, I think this is the last question yeah so i will yeah look at the last question here and then have a quick look at the uh, comments and see if you have questions i'll try to answer them uh, so there is a question about the great march of return and how it can help palestinians in gaza and elsewhere get out of the difficult box uh, they have been in for so many years does it help, yes or no, and how? I think uh, the Great March of Return helps, you know, Palestinians get out of this box. Uh, and uh, it provides a very creative way of bringing the issue of Palestinian refugees back to the surface. Palestinians in Gaza, the majority of them are refugees, including myself, are telling the world that our issue is not about food or the many crises we had to deal with in Gaza. Our issue is about incubation, actually, and our right to go back to our towns and villages. The protest is peaceful and it exposed the brutality of Israeli snipers who killed near, nearly 200 Palestinians in cold blood and injured some uh, 20,000 others. Palestinians know this brutality very well, but it's time for uh, people all over the world uh, to see how Israeli snipers deal with uh, unarmed Palestinian uh, refugees who ask for their right to return to their towns and villages according, according uh, to the UN Resolution 194. In fact, the recognition of Israel as a UN member was conditioned to its acceptance of Resolution 194, which Israel agreed to on paper and never allowed it to happen, never implemented. So after all these years in refugee camps, Palestinian refugees are taking the initiative to implement this UN 
uh, resolution themselves. Uh, I will, yeah, so I think there are two, some comments here. What do you think of supporters of Palestinian rights in the West should do? I think one important thing to do by pro-Palestinians everywhere, whether they are in the West or not, is to support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. It's a call by the Palestinian Civil Society in 2005, um, which called on different civil society groups all over the world uh, to implement a comprehensive campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel until it allows Palestinian refugees to go back uh, to their towns and, ha and homes according to the UN Resolution 194 and it uh, until Israel dismantles the, the wall and settlements in, in, in the West Bank and it treats Palestinians uh, who hold Israeli uh, citizenship to full equality because there is uh, much uh, discrimination against them. So if non-Palestinians want to help Palestinians is to support this movement and to isolate Israel. And we have seen, you know, in the previous year how the BDS movement managed to achieve many successes and that it's a very effective tool of practicing pressure uh, against Israel. At that time, you know, the international community is doing nothing. So we as a civil society could do something by pressuring Israel and imposing boycott, divestment and sanctions uh, against it. We have seen many in uh, boycott initiatives. We have seen many divestment initiatives. And rec recently we have seen actually div uh, sanctions uh, initiatives. Uh, for example, uh, the bill passed by the Chile uh, parliament as well as the Irish parliament. So we have some good news and we could do a lot in, in this regard. Okay, if you want to the right of return, how can you see that working out? You know, Israel always says that there is no space for Palestinian refugees, which is a big lie. If you look at refugees in Gaza, the majority of them were forced to leave villages and towns which are in some cases, one kilometer away from where they are now in refugee camps in miserable conditions in Gaza. While if you drive 10 minutes away, you will find, you know, modern Israeli cities and towns, paved roads, hospitals, infrastructure. Uh, and you see this discrimination and injustice happening in front of your eyes. And again, Israel claims that there's no space for Palestinian refugees. While if you look at the map of Palestine, you find that. 80% of villages which were ethnically cleansed in 1948 are still empty. So it's not because there is no space. It's because Israel doesn't want Palestinians. Israel wants to get rid of Palestinians, uh, those who are in 1948 Palestine, in Jerusalem, the West Bank, in Gaza. Israel has a problem with Palestinians. It's not uh, an issue of uh, space. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. There are more, no more questions. I will conclude. I would like to thank you a lot for joining us today. I would like to thank uh, Just Web Educational, and I invite you all to visit their website, www.justwebeducational.org. Uh, if you have further questions, you could uh, tag me on Twitter. My name is Yusuf Jamal, Y O U S E F. Al Jamal A L J A M A L, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you again until we meet in a free Palestine. Thank you.